Hello, Nevada. My name is Maureen Kerner. I'm the Associate Director of the Environmental Finance Center at California State University, Sacramento, otherwise known as Sacramento State. And now uh, welcome to um, a webinar series. It's four parts. Today is day one, and we're going to be focusing this week and next week on funding water programs and projects in Nevada. A little bit of housekeeping to start off. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so you know. Um, the video link will be sent to registrants shortly after the webinar completion. Um, we will be posting slides to EFC at Sac State website, so you, um, which is provided down below in the orange. And I'll have that throughout the rest of the presentation and discussion today. Um, we will also be notifying all registrants once those, um, once those slides are posted to the website and available. If you have questions today, you'll need to post those through the go-to questions. Um, and uh, we have a lot of time for a Q&A session at the end of each speaker. So you can go ahead and type your questions in at any time and then we'll, at the end of each speaker, we'll direct the, the slew of questions towards them. There we go. So um, thank you to our sponsors. Today is brought to you by um, a, a series of funding from the, from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, a couple of different grants. There's smart water management systems um, for small water systems, um, a grant for the Environmental Finance Center Network. I'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, we've got several of those centers within the network that are supporting today, speakers from the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. I'm from the EFC at Sac State. Um, Syracuse University is helping and um, University of North Carolina Environmental Centers are, are helping us run these webinars too. And then a big thank you to Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, Jason Cooper and his efforts to really make this, this webinar happen. So a little bit of background like I promised on the Environmental Center Network. Um, we are a, a series of 10 centers located in all the different 10 regions of um, EPA in, in the US. Um, we focus on um, providing technical, managerial, and financial capacity development for environmental systems. So whether it be water, some do wastewater, drinking water, storm water, um, sometimes even air management, and sometimes um, assisting in, uh, industries or businesses with their different um, energy management um, need, um, needs. And you can see the whole slew of different services that we provide. There's technical, direct technical assistance, where we've got folks that go and work with individual systems or utilities. Um, and we also do a, a slew of different training for, say, operator training and certification. We do webinar series. We do in-person tra training, um, things like rate payer and citizen support, trying to get upper management or board support. Um, sustainability, resiliency, fiscal planning, all kinds of things that utilities need to make their systems sustainable in, in the long run and being able to pay for everything that, that you need to do. So like I said, uh, for, for the California State University Sacramento EFC, we are located in Region 9 and we serve California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, the Pacific Islands and, and tribal lands. Um, the neat thing about the network is even though that we're kind of focused on Region 9, many of the, the EFCs operate in states throughout. So it's a really collaborative partnership. And I invite you to uh, check, check out our website as well as the other EFCs uh, throughout the country. So a little bit of background and just reminder of kind of why we are here today and why we put this together, the intent and content for this series as a whole. And really there's just this growing demand on water programs. You have aging infrastructure, there's fire, drought, floods that so many are facing um, in response to climate change that they have to deal with now or looking out in the future of how to prevent those things and, and put mitigation plans together. Um, there's emerging contaminants, there's new and changing regulations, there's decline and depletion of groundwater supplies, just so many things that utilities have to be thinking about. Um, no matter if you are into drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, watershed planning, flood control. And so we got together with, um, with Jason Cooper of Nevada Department of Environmental Protection and talked about those challenges. And he's got opportunities and there's a lot of different opportunities that folks 
states, state local agencies, the EFCs have to help um, utilities and systems kind of um, address these challenges. And that's kind of the intent for, for what we're getting at um, during these seminars. Because really with all those things that you're facing, how are, what do you need? How much money are you gonna need and how are you gonna get it? And so we've tried to put some strategies together for you today. So the intent is again, to recognize with all those demands and needs, there's challenges to get funding, to do all the things that you wanna do. So the programs, just operating the program, of putting, putting in projects, but managing your personnel, doing operations and maintenance, doing your reporting, all those things that a system or utility has to do, those programmatic challenges, but then also needing to pay for projects. And so some of those specific challenges would be things like competing local priorities, there's barriers to be getting to, to getting fees um, that would pay for some of these things, um, staff and time, staff time and capacity. There's insufficient, sometimes insufficient grant and loan funds, but you'll hear a lot about the opportunities that there are um, throughout this webinar series. Um, we're also going to try to provide tips for addressing the challenges. So identifying, char characterizing your program activities, how to estimate costs. Um, making water programs politically relevant so you can get funding, and then choosing consultants and experts, planning projects and the like. So the way we've broken these up, we're gonna do two webinars this week. Today is day one, May 18th, and we're gonna focus on um, understanding program costs and funding options. Um, and then on Thursday, May 20th this week, we're gonna continue with a discussion on program funding and the focus will be on pursuing sustainable funding streams and revenues. Next week, we go into days three and four where we kind of transition and start talking about how to do project funding or how to get project funding. So we'll focus on developing projects, preparing to obtain funding on Tuesday, May 25th. And then our last day, Thursday, May 27th, we've got a series of speakers um, putting the faces of um, that have funding sources bringing them to you, letting you know that you can reach out to them, learning a little bit about their programs. So we've called that applying for specific funding sources. Today in particular, we've, uh, we're focusing again on the understanding program costs and funding options. Um, I'm kind of getting through my welcome here. Um, and I'm gonna be turning it over in a little bit to um, Jason Cooper of Nevada Department of Environmental Protection. And he'll talk about the perspective from um, Nevada's State Revolving Fund on the funding challenges and needs and, and things that they're working on. Eric Porter, my colleague at the um, Environmental Finance Center at Sac State will give an overview of asset management, estimating costs and funding. And then we've got a neat um, opportunity, Jim Kerr, the Superintendent of Elko, Elko County Public Works has agreed to kind of do a interview or case study of sorts, talking about the challenges and, and um, the way his programs function and, and the funding aspects there. Um, and then finally, I'll come back and give you a quick recap and uh, next sessions. Talk about the next sessions. So with that, before we move on, we want to do a poll, and it really is just kind of to see who's with us today. So I'll ask test clerk of Syracuse if you could do that for us. Absolutely, so the question is, what type of organization do you represent? So you can tell us if you are a small municipality or water system, a medium municipality or water system, a large municipality or water system, consultant or in education. And we'll just give you a couple more seconds to fill that in. Um, Give it a little bit of thought, and I'll close this poll in three, two, and one. Okay, and our results today show that we have 38% of folks today are consultants, but a fair amount of people are also water systems. It looks like collectively 25%, 19%, and 6% are all water systems. Um, and we do have 13% of folks here from education. And back to you, Maureen. Great, thank you, Tess. Welcome, everyone. Um, at this point, there's a little bit of background information of, of some of those resources for you. I'll show these, this slide throughout today so you can um, have it 
at the ready. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jason Cooper of Nevada Department of Environmental Protection. A little bit about Jason. He is the manager of the State Revolving Fund and the State Capital Improvements Grants Program with the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection. Jason and his team of four dedicated individuals manage $555 million in assets for water, wastewater, and stormwater systems of any size. Jason is a certified government financial manager and has been working in the public sector of government accounting and finance for 14 years. After spending his early years living in Imlay, Winnemucca, Fallon, and Fernley, Jason moved to Las Vegas to attend the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He earned his bachelor's degree in hotel administration, and he currently resides in Reno with his family. So welcome, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. And, and I want to also extend a thank you very much to EPA and the Environmental Finance Center for being able to put these uh, webinars on for us and for the citizens of Nevada, the water systems of Nevada, uh, water, wastewater, stormwater, non-point source systems. Uh, just wanted to provide a kind of a quick summary from our perspective here because I'm also anxious to hear from the, the other presenters today a little perspective from our level of, of where we are at. Um, the, the state revolving fund does manage quite a bit of money and has quite a bit of money available for loans. But we do also take into consideration uh, and, and are more than happy to fund small systems as well. So uh, we wanted to make sure that, that folks understood all of the opportunities that were available to them. We've been trying to do some outreach recently to get a better perspective of what uh, kind of systems and um, entities out there are in need of assistance financially, but also how many of them are familiar with us and what we can do. There's been quite a few misconceptions about the SRF program over the years that we can only fund either a large project or we can only fund small projects or we can only fund you know, $20 million or less or something of that nature or, or what have you. And, and that's actually not quite the, the truth. We can fund lots of different projects. We can fund many different sizes of projects. We are a loan program, but we also do have some money that we can offer as what we call principal forgiveness funding. And we do also like to partner fund with other agencies as well when a project becomes really large and it makes sense to combine funding with other funding sources. So we've done some outreach. We've tried to, to see what the needs are out there. We've tried to get a better understanding of what, what people know about us. We're finding, we, we did a survey back in February and March. Uh, to, we sent the survey out to all the water systems all the wastewater systems, all the non-point source uh, permittees, as well as those folks that are in contact with uh, non-point source groups here at Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, just to try and get some feedback. We actually didn't get a large response back from folks, and it might be due to fatigue from the COVID virus uh, um, webinar survey links, if you will. Um, but what we did get back was just some feedback that folks are not very familiar with our program. They're not familiar with what we can what they what we can fund, and whether or not their system would qualify for funding. Um, over the years, we've also heard too that there's there's quite a few folks that have problems. They have issues within their system, but they don't even know where to start. How do they begin funding a project? How do they begin developing a program? And so when Environmental Finance Center approached us about doing some webinars for Nevada, that was really where we kind of thought that, that we could offer some assistance here in this case of, of being able to do some presentations on how do you start a program or how do you, or things that you need to consider in running a program, things that you need to consider in funding a project, because they are two different things, having a program that manages something versus having a project that addresses a need. And so we felt that this was a good opportunity to, to kind of get that get the word out there, share the information about what funding resources are available, not only from NDEP through the SRF revolving fund programs, but with our partner funders as well. And we have invited um, USDA, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture's uh, Rural Development Office, Cheryl Couch. Uh, we've invited the invited the uh, Community Development Block Grant, CDBG Group, to also come and do a presentation on the last day of this series to really talk about the funding that they have available and what opportunities that you may have um, for your projects moving forward. 
We still don't also know what's going on with stimulus funds, and there is a good chance that stimulus funds will be coming through these programs pretty fast and rapidly. Um, so we're also trying to, to make sure folks are understanding what the needs are for getting themselves lined up for, for ready, uh, project readiness to proceed. If, if funds come through in a large wave to Nevada, um, that we would be able to help them out in a timely fashion. So uh, again, I'm grateful for EPA to be able to put this on and, and Environmental Finance Center for organizing it and hosting and, and collaborating with this. And I look forward to working with them and through this process and listening to any feedback that you may have for us. We, we are open, we wanna hear how we can improve, what we can do better. If there's something that you don't know about, we're, we're here and would love to work with you on any project you have. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Maureen for the rest of the uh, presentations. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, we, you know, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier and Jason said again that, you know, on, stick around, especially next week, we're going to be bringing um, the faces of the different state, federal, local agencies who have funding opportunities available and assistance. I also wanted to mention that the Environmental Finance Center Network, again, through another funding from EPA, um, has technical assistance support um, services. So um, you can go ahead and contact the Environmental Finance Center. They've got a, a link on their webpage to fill out. If you're looking for any of these different topics, kind of um, um, personalized, system-specific assistance in trying to go after funding, whether it be looking at rates or um, filling out grant applications, kind of the whole thing of you name it. So, so assistance is provided right now. I encourage you to reach out to those Environmental Finance Centers, including our own at, um, at EFC at, at Sac State. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to my, my colleague Eric Porce. He's going to walk us through uh, an overview of estimating costs and funding. Uh, a little bit about Eric. He's a research engineer in the Office of Water Programs at Sacramento State, and um, and a visiting assistant researcher at UCLA's Institute of Environment and Sustainability. He has a background in engineering, public policy, and environmental science. He focuses on applied research for studying urban and environmental systems. So Eric, it looks like I can see your screen and you can take it away. Thanks Maureen and welcome everybody. Very nice to be here. Um, you will have a chance via um, Tess and Maureen. You can, if there's any questions that come up along the way, I believe you can submit them. Um, and so we'll uh, answer any, any questions we have um, at the end. So we want to just give a, an overview of the process of getting towards funding your systems, your programs, your infrastructure, and what are the building blocks of that? And so one um, so one tool we've been working with utilities a lot um, in various sectors is how to use asset management um, to be able to estimate costs for what you need uh, in your systems, and then to figure out how to turn those cost estimations into funding. Um, this is something the EFC has been working in for decades. And so I'll, I'll highlight again what Maureen mentioned that um, there's definitely technical assistance out there um, and working with um, state agencies, connecting up with the federal the, the um, networks uh, for the EFCs can, can help get some technical assistance. If you're not quite sure where to start or you have some questions about following through on this. But really the best way it's sort of getting organized um, is, to, is to pick a process to be able to find out what's in your, in your system, figure out what your needs are, and that gets you towards the funding. And asset management is a great way to do that. Let's just talk about a few terms um, to begin. So asset management is an organized process to improve your systems and spend money wisely. And then in order to enact an asset management plan, you need to get organized to be able to do this. And there's the asset management plan itself is very important for several other types of planning documents that will help demonstrate that um, you have a, a plan, a long-term plan in place that will be appealing to various funders. So a master plan then is a description of activities um, and long-term investments that you need to meet your management goals, um, to be providing your levels of service that you, so, that you want, and to be supporting what your community needs out of your systems. A financial plan then 
is the detailed analysis of current and future revenues, expenses, rates, and cash flow, right? So various of these different plans are important for different parts of your utility management um, picture. The master plan helps uh, figure out what are you gonna do today to be able to support what you need tomorrow. The financial plan helps you demonstrate that you've got the fiscal resources available to do those things that you want to for the master plan. And then finally, how do you go about getting this all done? Well, some sort of program, right? So a program is the institutions, it's the personnel, it's the departments, the accounts that help you carry out the plans. Sometimes programs can be organized with as a utility. Sometimes programs might be organized just as um, a, an office or staff within um, a broader, say, city or county. So um, understanding how these kind of uh, components of utility management fit together uh, is very important in um, identifying how you get from where you are today, identifying what you need, and eventually getting to where you need to go for what you want to do with your um, for your future improvements. So let's look at a few details of asset management and um, set the stage here for what we'll be hearing out the, hearing about through the rest of rest of these webinars for turning your needs into funding um, uh, within your systems. Asset management, as I mentioned, just to hit it again, is a process for maintaining reliable systems operations. It's an organized process to get you from, um, to be able to record information uh, about everything, all the components that are in your system and figure out what, um, what needs are there. You develop an asset management approach and you outline it through a plan. And you kind of write, as you craft this plan, there's tools and data that, un, that underlie it. And then in addition, um, you can actually codify it within a plan that demonstrates that you um, have a way forward. Increasingly, for funding sources um, across the spectrum of state and federal sources, um, they want to see demonstrated activities that represent asset management. So we'll look at it, um, a little bit about what those are. Um, asset management, um, federal and state agencies have recognized that this is an identified need and especially in small and medium sized systems. So there's a big emphasis on it in, um, for, in lots of different um, sectors of the water, uh, of water, wastewater, stormwater management. And asset management includes technical, manage managerial and financial aspects. So uh, kind of to summarize two um, basic bins of work you might be doing, you're gonna be trying to evaluate your system needs. So the infrastructure investments you need, the management needs, the program needs. So that, require, that looks at uh, operations and maintenance, permit compliance and future build outs. Then also evaluating those financial needs. How do you go about estimating costs and revenues? And that's anything from staff and labor over to um, you know, um, uh, evaluating needs for investments in pipes or pumps or anything else. So at the EFC, we've been working, um, especially we got started at Sacramento State's EFC, uh, working on asset management for stormwater systems, but essentially asset management, the process, um, it, it, for a lot of different types of water infrastructure planning, we follow some general steps and we outline them here. Um, so in order to undertake kind of asset management and get to get a, get from um, understanding your needs and your system to financial plans at the end, you want to follow some basic steps. So first is developing an asset inventory, a list, an Excel sheet of things that are in your system um, and characteristics about them. And then you have to define something called levels of service. So what, what services are you providing your community? Some of you might have outlined levels of service already. Um, and so you know the sorts of levels that you want to be providing. Then you can use those two tools to estimate costs for what you need. So you know what's in your system, you identify what the levels of service are that you want to provide, and what are costs associated with keeping and maintaining the current system, um, but then also filling any gaps to be able to reach that, uh, report, that desired level of service. Then as part of the asset management process, then you're also going to be looking for solicitation, soliciting input and listening. What are the needs? If you've outlined levels of service, do they provide what the community needs um, for you know, um, either for infrastructure or, 
or anything from flooding to um, stormwater to water supply to street sweeping um, across the board. And then you can undertake um, a, a number of steps for financial um, capacity assessments to be able to, under, to recognize how much you can fund and where you can fund and what you need to fund and you can identify funding options from there. So we'll be talking about five and six and seven here in more detail. We'll see some case studies um, from communities throughout Nevada uh, in the, in, over the course of the coming webinars. So, um, and it's important to recognize that it's really difficult, if not impossible, to get to five, six, and seven steps if you don't understand what's in your system, these kind of building blocks of asset management, asset inventory, and understanding your needs. What is in your system, right? So I've, um, just to reiterate, an asset inventory is a detailed, um, it's detailed data on components of systems and the associated conditions. So an asset inventory is gonna include data such as when it was installed, how old it is, uh, where is it located, what's the, is there um, some sort of condition assessment available, and maybe what it serves, what its purpose is, right? And you can use this data to figure out, once you get it kind of all in one list, what's the most important um, or most important components, maybe you might end up prioritizing them based on um, different factors of, of what parts of your system are most vulnerable or the most likely to um, reach their end of life or whatever. We'll see a couple of examples of that um, in the next couple of slides. And then that level of service, is the maintenance and replacement targets that you need to provide reliable system for your residents, right? So just having your assets in the ground and well-maintained may not be sufficient. And asset management, you have to compare that to really what you want to do and what your community is asking you to do, right? And an asset inventory is the key to asset management and financial planning. You have to start with uh, getting good data um, to be able to know what's in your system and this can take a long time, right? So this is not something that just arises overnight. You, your staff need to be out there. If you've got, if you're starting with not, without a lot of recognition of the locations of the pipes, how they're connected and so forth, you know, pipes have been laid over years and years um, without detailed plans. You need to go back to your as-built drawings. You need to be able to compile all this information. And um, we've seen lots of examples of even, um, uh, urban like city systems um, that are pretty far advanced and, and functioning well and reasonably well funded that don't have this sort of data readily available, right? And it's especially a big need for small systems when there's been lots of turnover and it ha hasn't has not necessarily been um, uh, a record keeping procedure that's been this, translated in the same over the years. Collecting data, data is the foundation of an asset management plan. So um, here, here's an example of an asset inventory for um, a water treatment plan. So you can just lay it out in a simple spreadsheet and you might have you know, the set of different components that are making up um, uh, comprising that particular asset. So anything from pipes to water lines, um, transmission lines, and then particular parts of the treatment system as well. These all have, you know, some number of units will be in the system. There's a date of installation and lifespan, and then you can calculate the remaining lifespan. And you can also figure out what the replacement cost is, right? And doing this actually lets you better uh, grasp what sorts of assets are in your system, when they might end up reaching their end of life, and what you should be saving now to be able to make sure that you can replace them when the when the end of life comes due, right? When when you reach that end of life, will you have enough cash in your account to be able to pay for those needed upgrades? That's actually what asset management uh, helps you do. And um, in this particular example, uh, you can if you kind of go through and come up with the current um, cost of replacement, we won't go into all the details about how ways you could calculate that now but you sum up down below and you can actually come up with a number, a target about needed capital improvements um, per year, right? And then what that might mean for customers or ratepayers. And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where then the difficult decisions start coming in and, 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 and um, working with your communities. And it's, it's definitely not easy. We don't want to sugarcoat it by any means. 
but at least if you've taken the steps that you can done due diligence to be able to develop your asset inventory and asset um, as, as that important component of asset management, you're at least off to a start of being able to communicate these needs uh, with the, um, the ratepayers or the folks who you're providing your service to. Now, why is prioritization important? You could end up prioritizing based on what might be most likely to reach its end of life or what might be you know, the asset that's in your system that would have the biggest consequences of failure. Or we even hear stories about um, you know, systems where they need to prioritize replacing assets because there's um, people, some folks in the community who are particularly interested in having that replaced, right? Um, and so there's the technical aspects of it, and then there's sometimes the social aspects of it too, of course. Why is prioritization important? Because prioritization helps you figure out what should be what you should be replacing and helps you keep stashing away money as needed. Because when something big fails, you need money in the account to be able to pay for it, right? Um, if you don't have it, that's when the cash uh, flow crunches happen occur and that's when you need when uh, we typically um, sort of hear folks looking around for um, what would what's almost to be kind of emergency sources of funding to get um, systems back up and running and in reality we should have been along the way making sure we're saving enough funds to be able to pay for those big um, spikes that will naturally occur as part of any system right you need to have cash on hand you need to have reserves to be able to pay for that that's how prioritization um, within an asset inventory and asset management plan helps you really avoid those big cash flow crunches because you've been saving over time to be able to make those the, your steady revenue lines even out with the big jumps in expenses that you can see at particular times. So there's a few asset management tools out there. And one of the things we've emphasized at the EFC and and a lot of the EFCs emphasize is that there's really complex ways to do this, and then you can also start with some paper and pencil, right? And so a spreadsheet, uh, a spreadsheet with data is a great tool. Um, there's plenty of commercial software out there. And then for years, EPA has supported um, some programs. Um, mentioned it here, the checkup program for small systems. You can still be able to download it and maybe utilize it a little bit. It's a, a little bit um, old at this point, um, but there are lots of um, asset management tools available and even uh, data, remote data collection um, uh, tools available as well. So uh, with mobile phones, if you've got service, you can you can go out there. And, and there are some third party providers that provide some of these services for relatively um, inexpensive costs. Um, uh, that could help to, to boost your productivity as you're trying to um, get towards this asset management goal. So if that all sounds pretty daunting, that's okay, because it takes a long time to get an asset management plan in place that's the foundation of funding. And as uh, Maureen mentioned, um, there is uh, technical assistance available within the Environmental uh, Finance Center network. Um, so we'll just highlight that again. If you do want to get started on this task, there are EFCs with lots of expertise. It helped um, uh, lots of systems over the years um, get rolling on this, and then uh, you'll at least have, uh, you know, kind of be on your way towards compiling that asset inventory that ends up being the foundation of the data that you need to get towards the funding that you want. So just a couple of notes on estimating costs. So once you have that asset inventory in place and you're trying to fill out that column for what, what items will cost, um, you know, once you have the, the actual knowledge of what's in your system, you can always go to vendors and providers and find out what replacement costs would be. And then you can start to categorize, especially if you have kind of a sizable system, if you're a medium-sized utility. So what types of costs might you use for categorizing? Um, you might have existing infrastructure that needs operations and maintenance costs, um, but then also you might have new infrastructure. And existing infrastructure, funding that O&M, oftentimes is different uh, funding sources than the new infrastructure. And, and we're gonna talk about a lot about that in the course of these webinars. So new infrastructure, it's capital investments. You can, you can develop long-term what they call amortized sources of it, but it's basically your, you get a loan or some sort of bond funding or grant or whatever now, and then maybe you're paying back, that back over some amount of time, right? And that's kind of what the basis of the, the state revolving funds, um, 
that DEP um, can help you understand better. That's kind of you know the 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 way that those those sources work. And you also have other types of costs, of course, the program management, and depending upon your um, your system, there might be some permit compliance costs too. And um, there's not necessarily always going to be one funding source that will help you meet all these goals. Um, so when you when you're able to kind of create the asset inventory, know what's in your system, but then also know what's in your program as well. Are you funding staff? Are you funding labor expenses? Are you funding contractors that are helping you do cleaning, maintenance, uh, clean outs, and so forth? That's when you can start to line up um, the different types of funding sources with what you need. Uh, it might be really simple. It might be kind of, you know, just a line of, of revenue. You're getting um, some rate funding in or so forth. But if you've got a more detailed system or you've got a larger system or one with lots of components, uh, then it can quickly get into a much more uh, um, difficult, fun, uh, much more complex funding picture um, as you're thinking about all these different cost categories. So here's just a quick example um, for how you would put together system maintenance costs. So what types of activities might you be doing for system maintenance? There could be inspection, could be corrective or preventative maintenance, replacement and renewal. So we have here uh, an example table for stormwater management, but you could you know, replace your assets, um, that left hand table there with whatever assets would be relevant for the water system or the wastewater system, collection system, what have you. So you'd have particular costs for inspection, costs for corrective maintenance and costs for preventative maintenance as well. And then <clears throat> potential costs for system renewal upgrades, uh, new investments in infrastructure. And that'll all total up, right? And you can total it up across all those asset classes and then come up uh, down below with the total amount that you'd be looking at for a single year for operations and maintenance and capital renewal and so forth, right? So as you're putting to get this um, all together, uh, uh, you know, just laying it out on a table is a great way to start. And then when you have to figure out what goes in a particular box, that's when you get to kind of scratch your head and figure out, all right, well, what would that really cost? And what is it going to take if I'm doing preventative maintenance? Can I get a quote um, from a third party vendor that might be providing it? Do I have staff that can do this? And so on and so forth. Cost for new infrastructure as well. So um, lots of municipalities, lots of communities are facing systems, are, are facing significant costs for new infrastructure. And in order to do this, oftentimes it requires new funding sources and partnerships. So um, all sorts of financing um, arrangements and or um, are, are, are possible, but you could think about our two basic ideas, right? Are you going to finance it? Are you going to get some outside source of funding and then pay that off over time? Or are you going to invest in stuff as you have money available, right? A pay-as-you-go sort of approach. And um, depending upon your choice, that might depend on, I mean, you know, it'll, it'll be dependent on the needs of your community. Depending on that choice would help you figure out who you should be talking to for grants and loans and, and so on and so forth. Um, once you figure out, you know, what your community is comfortable with, what your board is comfortable with, and so what, so have you, then you've got, you know, you put together like what funding sources make sense um, for what I need. And then finally, you know, when in thinking about your cost of new infrastructure, you have design considerations. Are you going to be planning for your current needs, sort of a five-year term, or are you looking farther in the future? Kind of depends on what you're interested in, um, and and are you are you uh, in the are you trying to play catch up? Are you trying to play just um, figuring getting uh, uh, investments in on into the ground for um, for items that are needed now, or are you ahead of the game and and um, building out future investments for what you might need 10 years down the line. Ultimately, what we all really want is to be able to move from um, reactive sorts of planning and procedures to proactive planning and procedures. And so that's where the process of laying out what's in your system, knowing what you need in the future, identifying your level of service um, helps you put together the funding to get towards the proactive investments um, that you can you can set up your communities well for the future. So just a couple of words about funding and financing um, in case the terms aren't uh, totally familiar. So uh, financing is the act of obtaining funds or capital to support a need and then funding 
you can think of more as the actual revenue used to pay for infrastructure and activities. Um, and you know, they're obviously closely related. A lot of times in, in documentation, you'll see them kind of um, uh, described together because they really are related, uh, of course, right? But you need to make sure you have the cash you need when you need it, and you can think about how you pay for those over the long term in lots of different ways. Um, um, but funding and financing are both critical aspects for you to be able to to understand how you're going to get from here to where you need to go. Lots of different sources. Um, maybe only some of these are going to be relevant for your community. Maybe many of them um, are relevant or all of them are relevant. But what we see, how we see folks paying for infrastructure and programs. So you can have revenues from utility rates, you can have bonds, you can have loans, um, grants, um, you can have just general funds. So it wouldn't necessarily be for a dedicated utility rate, but more generally, um, you know, if you're within a municipal system, uh, there's general tax revenues to fund um, items. You can have dedicated fees, um, all sorts of arrangements for public-private partnerships. We'll hear a couple of um, folks speak uh, throughout the forums, but also there's um, a lot of, a growing number of resources on these alternative sorts of financing mechanisms that might be of interest. You know, the take home message about P3s is you really have to try to tailor it to what you need um, to see if it's a good fit for what you want, want to do. And then finally, joint projects, um, you know, connecting up with local other systems or what have you. Uh, you might be able to spend money a little bit more efficiently because you're um, checking a couple of boxes instead of just checking one box. The EFC network has a nice uh, listing of funding resources by state. Um, so you, um, the, you can sort of uh, navigate to resources and check this out and I'll give you a starting list. But really, uh, you know, the folks that we're gonna hear from throughout the webinars, they're the ones um, who know what, what sorts of funding is best available, what has worked and what hasn't worked in Nevada. So we're just trying to help organize this a little bit to be able to make the connections um, as kind of the role of the EFCs um, throughout the country, right? So there's lots of resources available out there. It's really just a matter of knowing what's in your system, being able to describe your needs effectively because you've already done some analysis so that when you approach a funder, when you see a program um, that's that's um, valuable, that's important, you're able to, to work through this with them. So that's a quick overview. Um, emails there for Maureen uh, and myself. Uh, we're happy to try to make connections and help put you in touch. And I'll turn it back to Maureen for the rest of the program. Thanks, Eric. Great cover. Um, a couple of questions have come up for you. I'm going to read off the first one. Do you? Um, let me see. Where did that? Here you go. Do you have suggestions for how to learn about using GIS to support asset management? Yes, <laughs> great question. We actually did a webinar through the Environmental Finance Center network on free tools for GIS. This is so important. Um, there's lots of easy ways. So we've done some work with just uh, Google Earth. You can use Google Earth if you've got you know, a, a kind of a simple system with maybe a dozen or a couple dozen components. Um, otherwise, there's another program called QGIS available. And um, tests are the recordings of the prior EFC network um, uh, uh, recordings, are they available? Because we also might have it on our EFC site too, I forget. They absolutely are, and I will post the link to the past webinar on QGIS in the chat. And also I'll post a link to an upcoming webinar that is taking place tomorrow that Maureen and Eric's colleagues will be hosting on using Trimble GIS, which is another valuable tool. Um, for folks that are interested in this. Great. Yes, the we about six months ago, we did a webinar on using um, QGIS, getting started with GIS for free. Uh, and QGIS is sort of an open source, bottom-up um, version created by um, folks around the world. Uh, it mirrors all the capabilities of like the ESRI programs that are really expensive. And so it's a great way to get started and there's lots of um, webinars online. I think we give some links um, at the end of that webinar about using that. And then our colleagues, um, as Tess was mentioning, uh, we've been doing sewer system master plans uh, throughout the state of California over the past couple of years and um, using a Trimble GIS. And so 
they'll talk a little bit about you know kind of data structures and if you were able to get access to one of those types of tools that you know kind of how how you can go out in the field and collect information and data through one of those types of um, arrangements so absolutely great question okay thanks eric another question so other than the technical and managerial kind of aspects of that that have their own costs can you discuss funding needs such as those for debt service and reserves? Yes. Um, so our experience is most direct with this in California, and I'm sure Jason will be able to speak to this um, uh, really closely about sort of the what the funding needs are for um, reserves uh, if you're looking at um, state financing loan. But um, so generally speaking, um, for there's a few different types of indicators that are out there, right? And so um, for reserves, one indicator that's often used is cash, like days of cash on hand, right? And so if you've got, if there, if you know the world ends and your billing system goes down and, and you're stuck, then days of cash on hand. Um, how much money do you have? How, how long can you keep your system running before you run out of money? That's a great indicator, right? So can you keep running for 30 or 60 or 90 days? Um, it just depends on you know what the metric is that what what the metric is that you're shooting for. You always want a little bit more cash on hand than you probably have, but um, if you can operate for a month or two months enough to kind of correct that problem. That's oftentimes a benchmark folks are looking at um, for of, uh, as a as a TMF indicator, um, but it's often it's also a community specific uh, question too, right? So I'm not sure that we'd really be able to to um, it's a question for you to kind of look at with your books and, and figure out you know um, where your revenues are and where your potential vulnerabilities are. So days of cash on hand uh, is a great indicator. And then you, there's a number of other metrics that you can use, um, some simple metrics, and actually we can provide some links to those. There's a couple of really nice kind of whiteboard sessions, and you could go through your books and calculate, like, um, uh, you know, basically what's your um, operating ratios and adjusted operating ratios um, that are going to account for depreciation and so forth. And I don't know, I'll, I'm not sure if Jason would have any input that you want to provide on um, requirements for the. Um, for the revolving fund or other loans that you might I, I would be happy to provide a little update for the Nevada SRF programs, the state revolving funds on that. Um, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Maureen, but the question is um, more about debt service and reserves um, and the need for them in regards to funding. Is that correct? Correct. Very good. So a debt service reserve is typically required when a bond is in play. So whenever we have a loan that's required, um, if it's a general obligation bond, because Nevada purchases the debt of a local entity, we don't do a direct funding like some other states do. So we will ask the borrower to issue a loan, issue a bond that we will then purchase through the state's treasurer's office. If it's a general obligation bond, there is no debt reserve requirement per state requirements. The, res the, the reserve bond, though, does require a debt service requirement, and that's usually required with the treasurer's office's participation. We would then require a reserve to be set up in that case when a, re when a revenue-only bond was in play. And the amount of that would be based upon the, um, there's th three different parameters. So it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. We'd really have to get down into the weeds of the specific project to give a, a more specific answer about that but it would be required to be funded it could be done over time though also so i wanted to mention that because it's not a need to fund immediately kind of program but in recent days the fiscal sustainability plans and asset management plans that the state revolving fund has started asking for for systems to prepare and have ready when they're coming forward for principal forgiveness funds those things are actually something that we put in our intended use plan for both clean water SRF and the drinking water SRF program. We do ask that a fiscal sustainability plan and or an asset management plan in this case be prepared when principal forgiveness funds is being awarded. And we do ask that a reserve account be established that is equivalent to what USDA requires in a reserve account. So it's 15 years or less. 
Um, we use a straight line amortization and we utilize the information that's captured in the fiscal sustainability plan and or asset management plan that Eric mentioned as the way to calculate how much to fund in there each year. That would be something that we would look at as a, something that would be needed to be able to, to support to our board for financing water projects and the drinking water program that you're charging a sufficient rate to sustain your program. Because we, we see this as, as part of the technical, managerial, and financial capacity requirements that the drinking water program has. Uh, clean water has a requirement for fiscal sustainability plans for all treatment plants. So this also expanded into the principal forgiveness section for sustainability for those systems as well. And I, I hope that I've answered the question of the, of the, of the uh, participant. If I didn't or, or I missed something, please let me know. I'll be happy to add to that. Thank you, Jason and Eric. I think that covered it pretty well. I don't see any more questions. So thanks, Eric. I'm going to take um, the screen back. I think I see one more question, Maureen, that came in just a minute ago. Um, and the question is, uh, for small public water systems, how does a Nevada public water system request EFC network technical assistance? And is there a cost? Um, and how does this complement or, or how could it complement state capacity development programs? And um, as a EFC network person, I can definitely tell you there is no cost to any of the assistance. Um, it's free for systems under 10,000 uh, with popu serving populations under 10,000. And as far as how to request it, um, I can share a link. You can, you can request it directly online and we'll share the link with you. But I'm not sure um, if I can totally answer the um, second part of that question, which is about capacity development programs, other than to say that if you have a good working relationship with your capacity development coordinator, the EFC network will collaborate and work um, you know, to complement those programs and do the legwork to research those program elements. Um, Maureen, you work on technical assistance a lot, so I'll I'll be I'll let you finish up there. Tess, Tess, Tess I think you just covered it perfectly. So you can request that technical assistance um, directly through the EFCN network, and Tess will post that link um, into chat here. You can contact me or look at you know the network website or our EFC website. Um, if you'd like, and we could get you um, connected. Um, as far as how it complements or sub supplements state capacity development programs, um, the EFCs are really intended to try to work with you in your best interest. And of course, there's a lot of um, efforts that, that, that Nevada for their capacity development program um, has. And so the, the, the TA provider would come and work with you to look at what the state programs are. And again, just what, you, what that question was, is complementing and supplementing what they have to kind of walk you through that process and anything else you might need. Good question. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So I think we're ready to move on. And let me... Um, let's see. There we go. Okay, I'm going to introduce to you our case study in Elko County. So we thought, you know, Nevada has um, has you know some larger and some medium-sized systems and utilities and communities, and but several smaller communities. And we thought that it would be interesting to bring in a representative who can kind of tell us the story of you know their challenges and their um, perspective and, and success stories in that um, and how um, things work. And so Jim Kerr, superintendent of Elko County Public Works, the read to do this. Um, we had a cancellation in, the, in our presentation for today. So Jim, super thank you again for stepping in and willing to do this. We're gonna do it kind of interview style. I have a series of questions for Jim and, and he's just gonna kind of informally weigh in um, as he likes. Let me give you a bit, a little bit of background in Jim. I'm gonna read um, what he told us. I've been in the public work industry for 13 years, both as an operator, maintenance, and supervisor. My previous career was for 22 years, for 22 years was a process maintenance mechanic for the gold mining industry with a short stint in the 
power industry. My position currently works with small unincorporated towns of Elko within Elko County, Nevada. These towns range from 50 to 100 connections. With the population ranging anywhere from 12 to 200 people, deepening on the time of year. I've been involved in applying and managing grants for these small unincorporated communities using everything from CDBG, SRF, and USDA grants. And these grants have been used for things like spring development, water storage, pipe infrastructure, sewer lagoon lining, and flood mitigation studies. So thanks again, Jim, for joining us. And can you just say a hello so I can confirm we have audio? Uh, hello. Hi. Great, great to have you. Okay, you gave us in your um, in your bio gave us kind of a short um, description of some of the communities that you work with, but I'm wondering maybe just fill in some of the gaps. If you could start out by describing the Elko County Public Works systems in terms of type of um, of systems, water, sewer, etc., um, the size, and then the, the socioeconomic status. Certainly. Um, so. Uh... Elko County is uh, kind of unique as and um, we are the fourth largest county in the U.S. in square miles, but we're one of the less populated. So we have systems spread out all over the county that we try to manage, and they're small, unincorporated towns. Um, so there's I have uh, drinking water systems that are that are completely spring-fed. Um, I have a surface water treatment plant in one of my systems, which is um, uh, that that particular system actually is is uh, let's say um, listed as the most remote community in the lower 48. So in the winter time, it takes me four hours to drive that to to just to get to that system if there's a problem. Um, there is, uh, I have, um, I have systems with wells. I have, and on the wastewater side, we have mostly lagoons um, in, in the jackpot, which is managed by a different superintendent. There's a, it's a lagoon slash um, treatment plant, if you will. It's got um, uh, pre-treatment and then um, some, uh, some things that work with um, kind of like a trickling filter type situation. Um, let's see, what else? We also have, we also manage the, the solid waste for Elko County. So we have, and we have used uh, grant fundings in, uh, grant funding, sorry, for um, helping build some of the transfer stations that we've, um, that we manage. Um, that's probably about it for that question, I think, unless you want me to go into more detail. I think that's good. We'll keep asking. I'm sure more information will come out of you as we keep asking. Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so how would you describe the water system um, management challenges faced by um, those in Elko County? And then are there any issues, um, the biggest area of need, like water quality, affordability, or something else? um challenges let's see uh well obviously it it takes a special person to want to work in this industry and get in a vehicle and drive two hours a day to get to a system to um to manage the system so we it's there's been some difficulty in in um hiring and and retaining good quality people that are willing to uh, work on their own if you will because part of managing this system is you can't be everywhere at once so that makes it tough so we've uh, we've gotten lucky in the last uh, couple of years where we've got some really good employees that are self-conscious and work really hard and so I'm lucky there um, when it comes to asset management um, and uh, let's see, asset management, that's a little more difficult because our enterprise funds, because these towns are so small, the enterprise funds don't cover um, a lot of the funded for depreciation. So 
and me and Jason uh, Cooper have had some some discussions about this, and and we have some challenges with our board of directors, um, well, our county board of commissioners, if you will, because they're elected officials, they don't want to raise people's rates because they feel that that's raising. They don't understand, I guess, that that it needs to be self self funded. And their normal taxpayer dollars do not fund or pay for these entities, and so that makes it very very challenging from that side. Um, probably the biggest area of need, I would say, is just um, oh gosh, I don't know. There's so much. <laughs> Under the whole gamut, the whole water quality it, it, and yeah, there's a, there's a lot. I mean, yeah. so it it's it's tough to find people because we have such a large county. We have to we have to re, rely on a lot of times people that actually live in these communities to be our, be our eyes and ears, if you will, in the community and watch for issues and then let us know. So we have some part time people that live in all these communities that that you know kind of do our daily uh visual inspections and things and communicate back and forth so that's been tough um but yeah that's grant if it's not for grant funds these communities don't have uh safe reliable drinking water or wastewater what um what strategies have you found to be successful for funding is it just going for the grant funds or um, other strategies you can think of? Well, yeah, I, so strategies strategies have changed in the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that's made it a little more difficult. So with CDBG, um, they, you know, five years ago, they were, well, let's just say they would, they funded more infrastructure projects than they have funded in the last few years. They've kind of, in the state of Nevada anyhow, they've kind of switched their strategies, if you will, to where they're trying to fund more um, economic development type projects, which still can be infrastructure projects, but you have to have um, some kind of uh, in, uh, economic development twist to it. If you don't have this this economic development twist, it just doesn't even make the cut. But in the past, when we were able to commingle those funds, we would use CDBG funds to um, pay for the engineering of a specific specific project. And then um, SRF would be, they really like uh, what we call turnkey projects or what I call turnkey projects, if you will. And when you've got those previously engineers, they they are they really like giving those funds out to that, and so does USDA. So um, that that helps when we can do that. Um, things have been changing lately, and I kind of see a little bit of a swing right now um, with with especially with the COVID is issues. I think um, there's a lot of money out there right now, and they're trying to change some of the way they hand out this money. Um, so that's good, especially for small communities like what I manage. So we'll see what happens. But that, that's kind of been one strategy. Um, it's always nice if you can uh, get the project engineered up front for any of these uh, funding agencies. They, they like to see that um, little skin in the game, if you will. And turnkey projects are kind of like construction ready projects, right? Yeah, sh yeah. Shovel so, ready, I guess. Shovel ready, yeah. engineering's all been done. Yeah, shovel ready type projects that are, you know, you've already paid for the engineering. Um, let's let's say it's a uh, sewer uh, collection system, just hypothetically. You've you've had the, the system uh, engineered, they know what what lines are gonna be replaced, they know what lines are gonna be uh, slip lined or cured in place, if you will. They know um, if they're going to have to put any lift stations in, you know, all that's paid for and done. And so, you know, it's just a review process and um, making sure your rates are set correctly in order to fund for depreciation because uh, they don't like it if you don't fund for depreciation. Okay. 
Isn't, isn't that right, Jason? Well, the yes and no. So uh, <laughs> depreciation, depreciation in the financial uh, statements is something that we do take out when we do the analysis on the on the availability of funds. Technically, though, depreciation is what the short-lived asset reserve account is because you're basically funding the depletion of those assets over time, so you will then have money to be able to replace them long term. So, and, and the other part of the benefit of having those reserve accounts is that we're not an emergency organization. So, if a well goes down on a Friday, there's some safety net there that the community has some cash that they can tap into because we don't say you can't use the funds for replacing any capital asset of your system or or restrict it to the asset we funded it's it's really meant as a as a way to help you be more sustainable uh, in that case but that's technically what depreciation is it's just it's a it's an income statement item on a financial statement that's usually a non-cash related item um, we don't we do take those out when we do the analysis of affordability as well as sustainability but we do factor in what needs to be put into a short-lived asset account. Thank you, that's perfect. So Jim, you mentioned um, CDBG and SRF as funding sources for you. Do you have other um, sources of funding specifically for capital improvement projects? Uh, I have only used USDA, CDBG, and SRF. Um, I, Recently, I have uh, been researching and seeing that there's more more funding out there that I was unaware of. Um, so hopefully, I can start learning more about how to apply for that stuff as well. I was just going to say, did you have plans to pursue additional funding in the future? And so maybe some of our continued talks, especially the one next Thursday, where we bring in the different agencies and stuff, might be helpful. For you. Absolutely. Uh, like I said, these communities don't have these, uh, they don't have clean drinking water or, or wastewater if we do not have uh, this type of funding. Yeah. So um, you, you've been kind of talking a bit here and there, but any more um, things you want to um, mention? specifically regarding impediments to funding water systems and programs? Uh, <clears throat> you mean like um, hurdles that I've run into that try to hurdles get- Hurdles is great. Yeah, if yeah. you okay. can think of any. So yeah, I, I can talk about <laughs> lots of hurdles. So um, for instance, Elko County has, has taking some funds from, let's just say SRF. And um, we were we are not, or were not um, funding for depreciation the way we should be. And so um, we were trying to get the rates increased so that we could have that funding for depreciation. And we've had a lot of hurdles trying to get our, our uh, our fiscal affairs department to take it to the board of uh, commissioners and then when we have taken it to the board of commissioners in the future or in the past i should say not not right now because we're actually sitting on the agenda in a couple of weeks to take it in front of the commissioners again um, to to raise these rates they were un, unwilling to raise the rates and then they were unwilling in one case they were unwilling to raise the rates uh, at the at what we needed them to be raised to because again they they see these they, they just they see these small towns and they hear they hear people tell them well I don't have enough you know it's really really common for people to retire let me back up it's really common for people to retire in the state of Nevada in a small unincorporated town um, and of course when they retire to these communities they're they're on fixed incomes. And so they they plead to the county commission not to raise their rates because they don't feel like they can afford to to uh, pay their water bills and things. So we've had some issues that way. 
Um, but with we have a different commission in place right now that seems to be more willing to take the backlash, if you will, about raising people's rates. So that's that's positive at this point. And uh, I'm hopeful that we'll get our rates set more uh, constructively in the future. That's one of the issues. Yeah. Do you have a need that did somebody run away? Jim, were you or Jason, were you going to weigh in? Yeah, Maureen, if I may weigh in, I think this is probably a, a good benefit for everybody listening in too. And then the discussion that uh, Jim and I have been having about this. Jim, uh, the, the reference I think you're referring to is the funding that you guys or that the systems up in Elko County had received from the Capital Improvements Grant Program, which in Nevada is a state grant program completely funded by tax exempt bond proceeds and administered by the, the Board for Financing Water Projects. Um, that board is a public board, and that board is also the same board that has to approve the drinking water SRF loans. So that board has complete autonomy over the, the capital improvements grant program. Since it is a grant program, 100% of it in that case, you, you can't get 100% for the project, but you, can, you don't have to prepay anything. Um, they have actually added, the re, they have had a reserve account requirement since 1998 um in place and so this isn't this hasn't been new for them this is something that they instigated years ago in trying to put in a, a reserve account in some place and it was it's been calculated differently over the years but any borrower since 1998 i'm sorry any grantee receiving grant funds from that program since 1998 has had a requirement that they put money aside in a short-lived asset reserve account um, as a way to show sustainability. So what we did in the SRF was expanded into the SRF because it also is an USDA. And we felt that by having this crossover, it would actually be easy to administer and people would understand them and understand the reasoning for them. But we have a hard time as staff supporting in front of a public board uh, funding for a system that hasn't complied with the requirements of the previous grants for that project or that program. And right. so that's where we've come from, from this angle, is that we've, we've tried to uh, even also provide some technical assistance out there for Elko County. I understand that was pretty successful in the work there. Um, if it's helpful for me to also uh, come or, or be at a meeting with the council, with committee, uh, with the county uh, superintendent commissioners, I'd be happy to go to kind of explain the processes there. Um, in this case, we're, we're trying to ensure though that Elko County can continue being successful at the board in receiving more grant money um, and, and able to help these systems out by meeting the conditions that the board had put in place. So Absolutely. that's kind of some of the background too that might even help your your presentation to the commissioners as well that this is really it's not a jason rule it's not a it's not even an srf rule it was a capital improvement grant rule that came from the board for financing water projects well back into the 90s and then just carried forward into a new format so we've we've also tried to change the way it's calculated so it's more consistent with what USDA does and what we would do in the SRF. So you're still funding the same one account. There isn't three or four or five accounts that are required. It's one account that's required that meets all of the requirements uh, amongst all of the funders. So I hope that helped clear some things up and then maybe offer a little bit more help for, for the folks that are listening to. And, and actually let me weigh in here a little bit that actually helped us out uh because and correct me if i'm wrong jason and i'm not sure if people need to hear this but i i think it's good information uh srf actually funded a project i think it was you guys i'm pretty sure it was funded a project for a um a tank re a tank construction um and in in that process found out that Elko County was not funding for depreciation on a previous grant project. Well, they sent a nice letter basically saying that we weren't going to fund any more projects for Elko County until we set our rates at a higher rate and started billing off of meters, which we had put in, they had paid to put in a community. 
that actually helped us because we were able to get that community set at a better rate to where we were funding for depreciation and billing off those meters. So sometimes that's a good thing, if you will, to be able to have you know somebody kind of looking over your shoulder um, saying, hey, you need to make sure you get this funded or, or paid back. Does that sure. help? It, it does, and I would be, if, if it's helpful for the community to understand or have that support from us, we're happy to to move that direction as well. That board for financing water projects would have been the same board to approve the drinking water loans. They have asked us as staff to disclose funding uh, compliance with across projects and how is the community as general um, been responsive to um, what the board has asked them to do for, for anything that they've approved. Um, water meters are definitely part of that too because the the members of the board recognize that there's a there's an importance to having conservation built into your system as well so that's if there's anything that we can do write a letter show up at a meeting um, and and then add those little things in we're, we're happy to do what we can to uh, help the process forward Jim, there's a good question that came in. It says, with your systems being so rural, and it sounds like you have an attrition, attrition challenges, what do you see as a way to get people interested in the water or wastewater industry? Ooh. And then is there funding for this? That is a good question. If there is funding for this, I'm unaware of it. Um, I will say this much. The challenges, I think, across the board, um, from what I've looked at, for other communities in the state of Nevada is water operators are not seeing through their um, um, they're, they're just not paid enough <laughs> and and uh, there's a ton of cert you know certifications that they have to have to pass and and get and especially with us we offer you know we're not only operating drinking water we're operating wastewater and there's some definite challenges when it comes to wastewater stuff anymore with with some of the um, NDEP requirements that have changed recently with wastewater so um, that's been that's been tough and when you tell somebody they've got to pass three exams in 18 months or or they're not going to have a job um, that gets really tough so I don't think I don't know if I answered the question. Repeat the question again. <laughs> it, um, what do you see as a way to get people interested in water and wastewater? You and know, is there funding for this? I don't. I don't know. I think it just takes a certain type of person that that enjoys this type of work. Um, it would be great if we could, you know, set up something through the Nevada Community College programs to where we could, you know, get people pre-certified and kind of get get them kicked off um if you will but prior to trying to get a uh, uh, a career in this field um i'll tell you one of the things <laughs> believe it or not one of the things that helps keep people interested in in elko county is the fact that they're driving through northeastern nevada in certain times of the year they're they're going over uh two out uh 8000 foot passes in the summertime and you never know if you're going to run into elk or deer or whatever and they i mean and they love that right so that helps but it's just a perk to the job it's not you know anything else but it's it's tough to keep people interested i will sure. say that sure that you know workforce development and and hanging on to the workforce is a difficult thing we hear throughout you know throughout here in california and then even throughout the the country and actually i'll mention that you and i can talk offline but the environmental finance center does some does some efforts for workforce development and that might be able to help you and okay. uh, we can like I said, we can talk later offline to, to see what we can get get for you going there awesome. great Okay, continuing with some of the questions here. Um, do you have a need that cannot be addressed because a program does not exist to support the needs? For example, stormwater, non-point source program? Um, 
Well, you know, we we have done some stormwater stuff, but we've used CDBG for that. Um, I like it, and and I've I've learned some about some grants just today. You know, grant opportunities or funding opportunities, if you will, for like by for flood control and stuff. And I'm I'm going to look into that because I've I've got a community that seems to flood about once every three or four years, so um, I am looking. I am looking into that, uh, or I will be looking into that uh, shortly. Um, so yeah, I guess I do have a need that is tough. Um, funding for. Do you have? And then yeah, I was just gonna say you know it's tough on how to get a program started. Um, do you have do you have suggestions or difficulties on how to get a program started that would help address the need a program like for elko county or just in general are you in general in general i think you know i don't know for me it's you just got to jump into it and and just say i'm i'm gonna do this and and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna apply for these this funding and even if it no matter how um confusing or difficult it may be and sometimes you know you get all the way through the process and and I've also run into this when I take it in front of the board of commissioners to submit for the grant they tell me no we're not going to do that so yeah I, I I have some of those issues and difficulties too especially politically um, I will say that our board of commission is they look at grant funds as a waste of taxpayer dollars and let me clarify why they do that or why some of them do that um, they're ranchers a lot of them and they what they what they see is so they see that they can take and go out and drill a water well in their field or next to their house and they drill a water well and we're, I'm just going to throw out a number it's not say they drill a water well for a hundred thousand dollars and and they get 500 gallons a minute out of it but yet if i want to drill a water well for drinking water purposes because of all a lot of the um uh i'm gonna call them hoops you have to jump through the costs go up um and then of course you know anything over a certain amount of money you're going to pay Davis Bacon wages, which means the costs go up. So when they look at this and they say, I can drill, how come I can drill this well for 100 grand? But you're going to drill this well and you're saying it's going to be 250,000. What, you know, that's not right. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to vote for it because it costs too much money. And what they don't understand is, and this is where it becomes difficult, is, well, first of all, the enterprise fund isn't large enough. To be able to fund itself um, to drill this well, let's say, and because you know you won't set the rates high enough, blah blah blah, and and, and so that becomes quite difficult. I don't know if I if I answered that question or not, but that is that is a huge hurdle trying to get people to understand why it costs so much more uh, to use government funding, but yet it's the only way you can get a project done. So fi final kind of set of questions for you. What suggestions um, do you have for improving current funding programs available for water systems? So are things that like state, federal, or local agencies could do? Is it a matter of technical assistance providers coming in? Um, is it communicating um, challenges with elected officials? I think all three of them, all you know, everything. If if the state and federal local agencies, um, I know that they, like SRF is very very transparent. They're always out there, letting you know, hey, we've got the money, uh, you know, please hit us up, please get on our list, you know, try to get these projects completed, um, and they do a really good job of that. And and. I would say so does CDBG. Um, technical assistance, uh, I can't really, 
it depends on what technical assistance you're looking for and what you and what each entity needs. Um, some people may need technical assistance just doing their their rate studies. Some people may need technical assistance when it comes to um, uh, operations and maintenance issues. Um, I use I use Nevada Rule of Water quite often for for operations and maintenance issues if I if I need them. Um, and communicating challenges to elected officials. Um, that's a tough one. Like I said, it, 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 it's tough to sit them down and make them understand. And, and sometimes having somebody come in from a, like Jason, to have Jason come in and, and maybe do a presentation uh, would help some of them understand why these rates have to be set with the way they are and why it costs so much more to drill a water well. Uh, but I'm always, I, I obviously sitting through this today, I learned that there's more help out there, especially through your office. So that's, that's good. Sure. And hopefully everybody else learned that too. Yeah. Well, we'll keep talking about those opportunities and stuff as the webinar series continue on. Um, thanks so much for your time today. Um, I think it, it helps kind of frame a lot of the challenges of, of, um, of for funding and just trying to keep systems operating and addressing all the different challenges of aging infrastructure and changing regulations and just trying to do what you're doing. So thank you. No problem. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, it's been a good, uh, so far it's been really informative uh, webinar. Great. Appreciate it. I'm not seeing any more questions that have come up. So I will. Move on. And let me see here. Looks like a slide is missing here, so I'll go back to our links here. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to go all the way up to um, give kind of a recap for, uh, for the rest of the webinar series. If you'd like to come and join us on Thursday, May 20th, pursuing sustainable funding streams and revenues, we've got some dynamic speakers coming in to talk about strategies. We've got Von, Commissioner Von Hartung um, um, coming in to give the perspective of an elected official. Um, and then we've got some talks about how to, um, how to kind of sell your system and your funding needs and that to your stakeholders and being a self-proponent to get the funding that you need. Um, <clears throat> on days three and four next week, we'll turn it over to project funding that I mentioned before on Tuesday, May 25th. We'll talk about, we're bringing in Heather Himmelberger from the Environmental Finance Center Southwest from um, University of New Mexico, and she'll give some tips on developing projects and preparing um, to obtain funding. And then we'll bring in several speakers, um, like we've been mentioning, on for different federal, state, and local funding sources for you. So we invite you to, to, uh, to join us for that. We're done a bit early today. It's three o'clock. We'd set this up for about a three, uh, for a two hour session. The next couple webinars um, just will we'll probably go until the full session, um, 3.30. So um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for those entireties. Um, just checking to see if there's any more chats or questions that have come through, and I'm seeing none. So um, with that, I'm going to check in with our panelists if they wanted to share any our other panelists, Jason or Eric, if you wanted to share any parting thoughts. Uh, this is Jason. I, I I don't have any parting thoughts at this point. I think that today's conversation was very good for everyone. I really want to appreciate and thank Jim Kerr for uh, participating today and helping us out going through these uh, issues that you've been having up in Elko and, and issues that other systems I'm sure are facing across the state um, and, and also success stories with them as well too. Um, Eric, I appreciate your presentation today on the asset management plans and that was very good uh, for myself as well and really appreciate uh, Environmental Finance Center's participation in this. Yeah, yeah thank thanks you, Tori. Jason. Nothing further from me but happy to help uh, and um, thanks for listening.
Yeah, I'll just mention there was one com question that just came in. How does one go about getting work workforce development funding? So it's not necessarily workforce development funding, but it's assistance on developing your workforce. And you can um, do that by checking out the EFCN um, network website. And in the chat, Tess had earlier provided the link directly. But if you go to that EFCN network website, um, you can fill out a technical assistance request and then they'll connect you with the workforce development um, um, TAs. With that, thanks so much for joining us today. We hope to see you on um, this coming Thursday and or next week and uh, have a happy Tuesday out. Thank you.